today. Um, I'm Secretary Linda Adams. I, I hope you all know that. It's nice to see you. Um, and you know, here at uh, Cal EPA, we've taken on a very huge role in the efforts to uh, fight global warming. And our policies have addressed various industry sectors and methods to help reduce greenhouse gases. In doing so, we recognize the very important role that energy conservation plays in meeting the state's goals. Um, it's my very uh, distinct pleasure this morning to introduce Nobel Prize winner Dr. Stephen Chu to this morning's seminar. Dr. Chu is director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and professor of physics, molecular, and cell biology at the University of California, Berkeley. That's quite a mouthful. Dr. Chu has become active in seeking solutions to the energy problem, and he co-chaired an inter- Academy Council study lighting, called Lighting the Path Toward a Sustainable Energy Future. He has previously been affiliated with Bell Laboratories and Stanford. And while at Stanford, Dr. Chu helped start BioX, a multidisciplinary initiative linking the physical and biological sciences with engineering and medicine. Dr. Chu has earned numerous awards, including the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics. He's an amazing scientist who has greatly contributed to the future of science, energy, and the environment. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Chu. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here today um, to talk about something I care very much about. Um, I just, I'm not going to go through a long litany of issues of the potential risks of climate change, uh, but I'm just going to talk about one of them. Uh, you can, there are many places where one can get a, a, a list of these things. And I want to caution you that some of these things, it's not 100% certainty or perhaps even a 90% certainty these things will happen. But uh, in most instances, we feel that it's certainly greater than 50% chance. And so when one talks about what sh we should do, think of it as, as uh, risk management. If someone told you there's a 80% chance or 70% chance your house will burn down unless you clear the brush around it uh, within 20 years, you might want to clear the brush around it. Okay. Uh, you don't say, I'm not going to do anything until you're absolutely 100% certain that this will happen. So let me talk about, of all the things that we think will be happening, let me talk about water shortages, which is near and dear to the California. I'll start with a paper that was published in 2004 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one of the most distinguished journals in science we have. And it actually looked at what would happen with two models, a B1 model, where the amount of carbon in the atmosphere will stay below, carbon dioxide would stay below 500 parts per million. The amount we have today is 380 parts per million, but if you include the carbon dioxide equivalent, it's about 420. So, so most people think that we will cruise by this, unfortunately. And then there's another one that says the current path is business as usual. In the most optimistic scenario of this uh, set of predictions, it's predicting that the alpine and subalpine forests that make up a major fraction of the California watershed would be reduced between 50% and a factor of four. So in, to appreciate this, if there are no trees in the forest or in the mountains and it rains, you get flooding runoffs, it's the trees that actually help the soil contain the moisture. And the Sierra snowpack would decrease by 30 to 70 percent. That's in the optimistic scenario. Um, there's another prediction that 78 percent of the British uh, Columbia pine forest will have died by 2013. That, by the way, that last prediction was in this century. And uh, you might think, oh, this is really alarmist. This is, by the way, what dead standing pine look like. It's brown stuff, and there's the still remaining live forest. So what's, and that's also a prediction of what's going to happen to the U.S. forests in the Rocky Mountains and the California. And the reason they're going to die is because the frosts don't kill the parasites like the pine beetles. 
And so they kind of run amok. The population of pine beetles runs amok. Now, you might think, is this a doomsday scenario? Well, according to the British Columbia Ministry of Forest and Range, the official government arm, not an alarmist organization, um, they're halfway there. 40% of the pine forests are already dead today. And so this is happening at a much more accelerated rate than we ever imagined. So it's part prediction, but it's halfway there. These are um, more advanced predictions of the Sierra snowpack. In the first half of the 20th century, 2020, 2049, 2070, uh, 2099. And here again, these are the means. Uh, this is the Bay Area. These are the Sierra Nevadas, where we have a lot of our water reservoirs. And in the first half of the century, you see that uh, in the lower emission scenarios, we have 75% of the snowpack remaining. Uh, but in, by the later part of the 21st century, we will have only 27%. You know what happens when we get about 75% of the snowpack in the Sierras? It's severe water rationing. But this is not one year or two years. This is prediction forever. Um, well, is there, are there going to be good things about climate change? Well, we are going to have longer growing seasons. So these, when you see red, you means you have a longer growing season because um, we're in the northern hemisphere, the northern part of the northern, northern hemisphere. Uh, and so you get longer growing seasons, and that's good. So we can raise more food. However, the bad news is there are going to be longer heat waves. Uh, the heat wave of, I think, 2004 that killed over 100 people in California, those type of heat waves will become more prominent. Uh, we also uh, are, there's going to be more droughts. So what, what, what the climate modelers are telling us is that the extremes in, in weather and temperature are going to be more frequent. Don't be lulled by saying, oh, there's a chance between 2 degrees and 6 degrees increase uh, in the world average. That doesn't really tell the full story. Um, where we are today in the world and a time before 6 degrees centigrade colder was the difference between us and the ice ages. During that 6 degree colder spell, all of Canada and the United States down to Ohio, Pennsylvania was covered in ice year-round. That's only six degrees difference. So we now believe there's about a 50% chance we will go five to six degrees hotter by this century. It will be a very different world. There is a chance if we act now, which can resolve the whole world, we can keep it down to one or two degrees centigrade. So it's not too late. Now, other things that are coming out, and many of these results are not in the IPCC report of 2007. Uh, they've come out much more recently. Uh, there's uncertainty about the res these results. And what climate scientists are now doing, including uh, we have some of the world leaders at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab and also UC Berkeley, is that as the Earth warms up and you get more carbon dioxide, what will actually happen? Now, as the Earth warms up and there's more CO2, the plants actually grow more. That's good news. As they grow more, they actually fix, they grab carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they put it into the materials of the plants and actually some of it actually gets into the soils. All good news. Um, but as the Earth warms up, also carbon dioxide in the ocean it will be released. It's sort of like if you take some sparkling water, fizzy water, and you warm it up, you know the carbon dioxide just comes out of solution. So that's bad news. Uh, we're also finding that as the oceans warm up, uh, there are stratifications in the temperature of the ocean and also in the mixing of the ocean. So what you have in the top is a lot of carbon dioxide that just gets dissolved naturally into the water, but it doesn't get mixed as well. And so it then circulates in the atmosphere in the water and you find a bottleneck. So the ocean isn't allowed to absorb as much as we once thought. Now, on the good side, the warming may increase the photosynthesis and enhance marine productivity, but there's something else coming to pass. Again, it's, it's early. It needs some verification. Other modelers 
But what they're finding out, especially where most of the vegetation of the world is, which is around the equator, what happens is, yes, plants do increase. But what plants do is they take water and then they transpire a lot of the moisture up into the atmosphere. So what is now coming to light is it appears as though the great vegetation, the tropical rainforest, will actually alter the ratio of water in the ground, the moisture in the ground, to the moisture in the atmosphere. The moisture in the atmosphere is a bit of a problem because that is a very potent greenhouse gas. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, actually more powerful than CO2. So it looks like as the Earth warms up, you alter the ratio of the amount of water on land or in the atmosphere. There's more water in the atmosphere, more greenhouse effect accelerates the warming. The problem is that in the last three or four years, everything we've looked at, as we look, delve into it more deeply, it appears for sure that the Earth is much more sensitive than we ever thought, and the downside risks are increasing. So it's essentially no good news in the last three or four years. Uh, this is uh, more of the same. It's just graphical representation of the computer models where around the equator you get warm, you get dry. Up in the northern latitudes in, this, uh, in Russia and Canada, you get warm, you get wet. But this actually, since the rate of vegetation growth in the northern latitudes isn't even close to the amount of vegetation you can grow in the equator, uh, it's just a little dimple. Okay, so what we're finding out as the Earth responds to the warming, there will be a positive feedback effect and it will accelerate the warming. And that's, and as we understand the predictions of 10 years ago, they turn out to be on the fringe of being wrong because they underestimated the amount of Arctic melting. They underestimated many, many things uh, that we now know are, have come to pass through direct measurement. So that's a problem. And we have to solve this problem, and there, there are two ways to solve it, and we need both of them. We have to maximize energy efficiency and decrease the energy use. And I would stress in the coming couple of decades, this is the thing we should really push hard. Uh, this is going to remain the lowest hanging fruit. Um, but we cannot conserve our way around this problem. We can't just say, OK, everybody sleep in sleeping bags, uh, uh, don't drive cars, things like that. There are many reasons, both sociologically, uh, but also uh, you just it's not going to be done. We also have to develop new sources of clean energy. Um, I want to do a little advertising for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, not to be confused with Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, Livermore, is its primary purpose is it's a, a weapons laboratory it, at Los Alamos makes bombs. We don't do any classified work in this laboratory at all. Uh, we are, uh, adja it's a basic science laboratory. It's adjacent to UC Berkeley. It's got about 38 hundred employees and a budget of a roughly uh, half a billion dollars a year. Uh, there's another distinction between us and Livermore. Uh, Eleven employees uh, who worked at the laboratory were awarded a Nobel Prize. Uh, it's 11 to 0. Nine of them did their work <laughs> at the laboratory. And, uh, and actually over 55 Nobel laureates were either trained or had significant collaborations with LBL. And the statistics I'm most proud of is that we trained over 30 graduate students, postdocs, and young scientists who later went on to get Nobel Prizes. I was trained at Lawrence Berkeley Lab as a graduate student as a postdoc, as one example. And so uh, we currently have in the National Academy of Sciences, which is the most distinguished uh, body of scientists, it's an honorific society, it also gives advice to the US government, there are about 2,000 members uh, in the United States in all the sciences. Um, and uh, it's limited in size, uh, uh, so that if you want to get in, you have to wait for someone to die. Um, they allow it to increase slightly, I think, with the rate of the population growth. Um, and we have 3% of the membership of the National Academy of Sciences today in the laboratory. So this research record of distinction is comparable to the top half dozen to certainly the top 10 universities around the world. Um, something remarkable happened in California during the first oil crisis. 
the amount of electricity used per person essentially flattened, while the rest of the United States, excluding California, went up by about uh, 55, 60 percent. And what happened was that a high energy physicist by the name of Art Rosenfeld turned his attention to the energy problem. So this is sometimes referred to as the Rosenfeld effect. He left high energy physics. He said, what can we do about this? He quickly realized that efficiency was the lowest hanging fruit, and he did many, many things. He's now, I think, the uh, uh, commissioner for um, California Energy Commission, yes. And he's 81 and still unbelievably going strong. He's certainly one of my heroes. Although, when he made this transition, I was a graduate student, and he got up and gave talks about energy. And I thought, oh, he's gone soft in the head. He can't hack it anymore as a physicist. And I'm sure young people are saying the same about me. Uh, um, anyway, but in my old age, I realized what a wonderful thing he's done. And he started many, many things. And in addition, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, in conjunction with the state of California, did many things. I don't want to go into them. Uh, they came out of enhanced building standards. They came out of appliance standards, utility programs, and so on. I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're planning to do to carry on this legacy of efficiency. We certainly do research in improving the efficiency of windows so they leak less heat or they allow less radiant energy to come into a building that heats it up so the air conditioning has to work harder. So we work on components, but we also are now thinking that even as these pieces of a building improve, the lighting gets more efficient, the air conditioning gets more efficient, and so on, they're the biggest capture of energy savings we now see are not in the components, but in the building system itself. And we were actually approached by United Technologies, it's a very large company in the United States that makes Pratt & Whitney jet engines and Sikorsky helicopters, but they also make carrier air conditioners, they make Otis elevators, they make building control systems. And they're, and they're really committed to trying to make the products greener and greener. For example, you know, you know that elevators go up and down. There's a counterweight, but of course, when there's a lot of people in the elevator, the motor's got to chug to go, or if it's going down, the motor's actually, you know, breaking. Well, they have hybrid elevators, so it's going down. Uh, it charges up a little battery that saves energy. So they're making things like that. So we've been talking to them uh, very seriously, and we would like to develop a system that any manufacturer can uh, link into. Uh, it's, a, it's a building operation platform, and we, we think of this as the Prius of buildings. Now, what do I mean by that? If you think about a Prius or a, a Honda Civic, these companies actually did not invent a better battery. They didn't invent a better electric motor. They didn't invent an alternator. They didn't invent any of this stuff. What they invented was a way when you step on the brake, you charge up, a, the energy goes into charging up a battery, and that's your brake. And that energy can then later be recovered to help accelerate your car from a the stop. They invented the idea that you turn off the engine when you're just sitting there in traffic at a red light. It was a building system invention. So we can imagine, for example, that you can integrate the windows and lighting when it's bright outside, the windows and the perimeter perimeter of the building automatically dim. The HVAC system in uh, the building can be continuously adjusted because we now have very inexpensive sensors that can sense how much CO2 that there is in the air. And you constantly tune the building via radio frequency uh, mesh networks that talk to the building and to a central brain. The brain has to be very, very smart because the people who are going to run the building are going to be less so. It's very much... <laughs> Like today's um, uh, engines in cars, there are, there are many microprocessors, at least a couple, that are constantly adjusting the fuel mix in your car so you can get either faster acceleration or better gas mileage. Uh, the, today's mechanic doesn't know how these things work. You know, when I was a kid, I used to fix my car. I can't do this anymore because it's a microprocessor-controlled car. But you take it in to get it serviced, the mechanic plugs your car into another computer, they talk to each other, and if it's a good car, they can locate what the problem is. Okay? We do the same for high-tech jet fire planes. So we need a very smart system so that it can constantly tell itself 
how to adjust the building. How to, and we think with this, at least from the simulations we've done so far, that we can save factors of two to four, not 20%, two to four in energy in reducing the energy requirements in the building if it's done right. Um, when you build a building, you have to commission it. You have to tune it up. It's called commissioning the building. You know, the, in most buildings, the air, you know, one room is too hot, one room's too cold. It's too cold that someone put the space here in the room. It's ter wasteful of energy. Sometimes they hook up the motor so the, the fans go actually backward, uh, and they don't know this. And so somehow the building doesn't work as well as it should have. You go and you tune this up, and it's called commission. Commissioning is a form of lawsuit today because the contractor doesn't commission the building. You hire someone else, and then finger pointing starts, and, uh, and lawyers get rich. Uh, if you have a smart building system, it can commission itself. It can tell you, the owner, the contractor could not have put this much insulation in because it's been modeled very accurately. We now know how to model buildings so that they consume within a few percent of the design, of the energy. Just as we now know how to model airplanes, so it's within one or two percent of the fuel consumption. Okay, so this is what we're looking for. Let me go, and there are many other things where we, we think we can make dramatic improvements in building efficiency that go beyond just the component level. Um, and United Technologies uh, is wanting to assemble a consortium of companies, lighting companies, building control companies, uh, lots of companies that then will hopefully give us lots of money. We can do some research. We set up this open platform that all the companies can then use to, to plug in their specific systems. Let me talk about the supplies of energy. In particular, I've listed uh, coal, gas, fission, and geothermal as a base load electricity. That means you can count on it day in, day, in, day out. And then you have renewable sources, which you uh, can count on less so, like wind and solar energy. Um, there are huge geothermal sources in the United States. Wherever you go down, if you go down six kilometers anywhere in the world, you get hot rock. Okay. So why, and you can estimate once you go down six kilometers, which is pretty deep, uh, you can, if you estimate the, the temperature rock, if it's above 200 degrees centigrade, this is the amount of energy in that rock that can be extracted. So you're in principle. Don't this is exajoules. It doesn't really matter. Just look at the number 296,000. Okay, this is the total energy consumption in the United States per year. It's much smaller than this number or that number. And this is the amount of geothermal energy we're using today. It's 0.3% of the energy supply in the United States. A lot of it is actually in California. Why is that? It's because in a natural geothermal reservoir, you've got a supply of water trickles down to the rock. The hot rock heats up the steam. We can extract the steam in a turbine. So you need a supply of water. You need porous rock, and you need to extract the water. After you spin a turbine, you spit the water back down. And um, quite often, you don't have the supply of water. Or p quite often, you maybe the rock is less porous than you can really extract efficiently, and so on and so forth. So there's now talk. And there's a, been a famous MIT study that was released a few years ago that talks about enhanced geothermal. In this case, you inject cold water down into the rock. The water gets heated up. You extract it. You spin a turbine. You take the water. You pump it back down. So far, it's not practical. But if it can be made practical, it can supply at least 10% of the base load electricity in the United States. So why isn't it practical? Well. Water dissolves stuff. And what, what they find, first, you've got to have a source of water. That's a problem. It requires a lot of water. Secondly, the water dissolves things. And as the water goes through this, these pores in the rock, it dissolves things and begins to plug up the little pores. And so it, there's more resistance. You have to spend more energy to pump the water through, all sorts of stuff. And the heat extraction goes down, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's, that's a problem. And what we're looking at is uh, a different system. What happens if you inject carbon dioxide down into the rock? The carbon dioxide then at these high temperatures and pressures becomes, it's not a vapor or a 
a liquid. It's just some supercritical fluid. Turns out the carbon dioxide doesn't dissolve the stuff. It can flow through the rock very nicely. You bring it back up. You extract it. You spin a turbine. You stick it back down. Now there's a problem. Sometimes you will lose the carbon dioxide. It will leak out. And, uh, well, that's not really a problem because that's what we, we feel permanently sequestered. We're doing research on the downside risks of this. We're doing more research on trying to get it. Unfortunately, the Department of Energy so far doesn't want to support this, so we're doing it on the fly. Uh, but it is a possibility, and we've been told there will be lots of carbon in the future. And so you can imagine building a carbon-emitting plant like a coal plant. Now the, the carbon dioxide from that coal plant actually has higher value because you can take it and you can ex put it down and you can extract more energy. And if you lose some of it, that's a good carbon credit once we have a price on carbon. So there's going to be a lot of drivers that would make, tend to make this more practical. Wind has been a big success story. Over the last 20 years, from 1980 to 2000, the cost of wind production has gone down by about a factor of 10. The windmills today are quite large. They're 3 megawatt capacity, and the 5 megawatt generators are now just being installed. These 5 megawatt generators have a wingspan of one and a quarter soccer fields. Um, they, uh, the people in GE make these tell me that that's going to be probably the limit for a while because you can't ship those turbine blades on trains or trucks because they can't make turns in the roads or in the railroad tracks. So that's going to be an issue. Uh, but if you look at where the wind is, you'll find that most of the wind, you know, here's ultimate pass, but most of the wind is in the northern Midwestern states. So in the Rocky Mountains, there's good offshore wind in Texas. There's a few other places like Martha's Vineyard uh, and other places. Now, the good news is the wind resources are where there aren't many people. So there are not many people who say, I don't want this in my backyard. The bad news is the wind resources are where there are not many people. So you've got to ship wind to the centers, population centers like Chicago, the East Coast, um, the West, including California. Um, we don't have a good national electricity transmission system in the United States today. We have a grid. It's actually a collection of about four or five grids. These grids are essentially serve the local customer base of a set of utility companies, let's say in California or in the southeast and so on. There's no reason why a power company like Duke Power in the southeast would want to ship energy to California. So why should they build a grid system to do that? Okay. So this is the problem. The wires happen to meet. Just like in the in 1950, we had no national highway system. A few states had turnpikes, mostly ro local roads that happened to connect to one another. So this is something that has to be considered if you want to ship renewable resources for thousands of miles. It's not cheap. It will be at least $500 billion to do this. We are behind the rest of the world. The rest of the world is, um, they're erecting transmission systems that allow them to trade between countries. Uh, they're also going to high voltage DC. We have a few high voltage DC lines, uh, but not that many. Uh, China, for example, is, is constructing a high voltage DC line that goes 2,000 kilometers. They only lose 7% of the energy. It's cheaper than AC, okay? And all these good things, um, but yet the United States doesn't have this because the way we do our power and our power transmission. Okay. Um, there's a big DC line going between Norway and Great Britain so they can trade back and forth in energy between hydro and wind. There's one, the first one was between Sweden and Germany, and there are other underwater lines going on. You can actually transmit gobs of energy underground, underwater with DC. Whereas in AC, you can't. You have to be very high away from uh, materials because there are, as the voltage goes back and forth, uh, there are losses that couple to the ground, to the water, and it's impossible to transmit DC, uh, AC uh, underground or underwater. Okay, let me tell you about a few other things we're looking at. We're also looking at 
ways to capture the sun's energy to make transportation fuel, and maybe to capture the sun's energy to make electricity much more efficiently. Uh, why transportation fuel? Well, it's the most expensive form of energy. It is a defining factor now in many countries' geopolitical stands, and, uh, and whether you consider we've gone to war already, it certainly looks very probable that nations will go to war over, over energy resources, in particular oil and gas. Um, in all these things, uh, both in wind and solar energy, uh, energy storage is a very big deal, and it's not a solved problem. The best method we have of storing energy today is pumping water up a hill into a dam and then releasing it, or pumping compressed air, air into a, uh, a used gas well or a cave that's not very leaky. And this is the best we have for large storage. But there are not many natural caves around the world, and there are not many hydroelectric sources, resources around the world. And so we need a general mechanism for storing energy, which we do not have. And that is a, that is a problem. If you want wind and solar to get to be over 50%, and solar, by the way, can be easily much more than that. Um, you, you have to figure out how to store energy. And of course, you can actually store energy in smaller things. Most importantly, your laptop computer, and your cell phone, but you can do a lot of other things. Let me give you an example. We're all hoping that very soon we can have plug-in hybrids. The current hybrids, the Priuses and the Hondas, keep a battery uh, between at 50% of charge, and they rarely let it go lower than 40% of charge to 60% of charge. If they took a battery and drained it completely after a few hundred times, guess what would happen? The battery would lose its capacity to store the energy. Yes, exactly what happens in your own experience with the lithium ion batteries uh, that you have in your computer. After one or two years, it's lost half its boost. Okay. In order to get a plug-in hybrid, you have to go from 1 to 2 kilowatt hours of stored energy to perhaps 6 to 12 kilowatt hours. And this will give you a range for a mid-size, for like a Prius-type car, maybe 50 to 100 miles. And um, if you want all-electric vehicle, if you want to go, let's say, pushing 100 miles, then you have to increase that energy still further. There was some research, a research program that went on for about nine years that said, we can do better than lithium ion. We can use solid lithium instead of a mixture of lithium and carbon on the plus side of the battery. And then there's this really gushy polymer that allows the lithium ions to migrate across. So the way this battery works is as follows, and it's also the way a lithium ion battery works. The lithium ion likes to actually make a chemical bond with the stuff on the cathode side, this blue side, which is usually a cobalt oxide or an iron oxide iron phosphate these days. And so it's just more stable. And so if left to its own devices, the lithium ions will migrate over and make a chemical bond here. But now positive charge is going this way, so you're going to compensate, so electrons have to go somewhere. So that's how the battery works. To recharge the battery, what you do is you put in electricity and force the lithium ions to break that chemical bond and go back. Now, as the lithium ions go back, what they do is they begin to plate back on this anode material, and they don't do it quite evenly. There's a little bit more here, a little less here, and it gets kind of lumpy. and gets a little jagged. So you do this a couple hundred times, and you find a dendrite cracked across and shorts out. So this program was canceled, even though it had great promise. It had twice the energy density of your computer battery. The solution was actually a very good idea, a very elegant, simple idea. This really squishy polymer that allowed the lithium ions to migrate across, you really wanted those properties. But it was so squishy that it would allow the lumps of lithium to plate back on the, the anode irregularly. We knew that if the polymer had such a high surface tension that as the lithium went back through the polymer and it had such a strong surface tension, it would prevent these lumps from growing. But the more rigid the polymer was, the conductivity went way down because the lithium actually had to burrow across. So there are two conflicting problems, and you couldn't solve it. So after nine years, the program was killed, abandoned. Along comes a young guy and says, oh, I can combine 
a really squishy polymer, polyethylene oxide, with polystyrene, which is the major ingredient in football helmets. Really tough. The physical properties of the football helmet is that it's so hard, the lithium would actually flatten out against the thing. It wouldn't allow these bumps to start at a microscopic level. But you just make these stringy strands of this thing, throw in a vat, mix it around. What happens is it self-assembles into layers of the squishy stuff and layers of the really stiff stuff. There is a positive anode, a cathode, and there's a squishy polymer, but it's now looking like this. And the lithium ions go like that, and they make it across just fine. But the surface tension is so hard that high that uh, it seems to work. A company was formed, rapidly growing, it's 10 people. Um, this is the first, uh, in the first results of their test battery, they got 90% discharge, which by the way, your computer battery won't, it won't survive going to 90% discharge. There's protection mechanisms that keep it at 80%. After a thousand discharges, deep discharges, no sign of wear at all. Which means you can extrapolate to 10,000. Well, 10,000 means for 15 years, your battery can be discharged fully every day no sign of wear. So a new idea may make a breakthrough. We hope it has commercial legs and can survive and can be manufactured. The lab will get a lot of money. Um, <laughs> but in the meanwhile, we've spun off this, and we're going back and trying other new ideas. So we'll spin off another company, try another new OK? So we're not going to stop here. But this might not work. But it's the best thing I've seen in more than a decade. Now, here's, here's my dream. I buy one of these plug-in batteries. There are 100 million personal cars in the United States, or in North America, includes you know, 10 million or 5 million in Canada. And uh, suppose you use half the storage energy of this battery to buy electricity at night where you can make it very inexpensively. Maybe when we go to real-time pricing, it'll be sold to us at 5 cents a kilowatt hour. OK. Uh, so you got 30 kilowatt hours of stored energy. That's a lot of energy. You can run your home electricity on this stuff if you, you know, so you can do, and oh, by the way, in a hot summer day when it costs 40 cents a kilowatt hour to generate electricity, maybe we sell back to the electrical company at 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Let them make some money. Um, and so you do energy arbitrage. You buy low, you sell high. Now, if 50% of the cars in North America use half their energy capacity of these type of batteries, that's actually 10% of all the energy we use each day in America. It's a huge thing. It's a huge amount of energy. Okay. So, so a good battery can not only make your computer work much longer, uh, it could actually have profound impacts on, on the storage and use of energy. Let's go to plants. There's been a lot of talk about biofuels. There's a lot of talk both ways that biofuels would be a disaster ecologically, and there are a lot of talk the other way that it's the answer to the world's energy problem in terms of transportation fuel. Neither is correct. In my opinion, in the United States, if done right, if done sensibly, it could be half of the cars that we use in the United States, not the airplanes and diesel, because you don't want to make biofuels from soybeans and diesels it's just too, that's not done right. It's not a proper use of the land or water. But here's to remind us what the limitations are. Up here, it's too cold, not enough sun. Black is good. You got enough rain, you got enough sun. Red is no good, not enough water. So the first thing that strikes you is there's a lot of desert in the world, and desert land is inexpensive. If you could develop photovoltaic solar cells or thermal, solar thermal, operating at 20% efficiency, that is to say 20% of the radiant energy hitting the ground can be converted into electricity, you would need a few tenths of a percent of the world's desert to power the, to supply the world's electricity needs. Okay. Well, but you need an overcapacity, so you can multiply that by 10. Still a few percent of the world's desert. The only thing we lack is the fact that it costs about a factor of 10 more than it uh, can to be competing with fossil fuels. And what's the progress? Well, you can actually make a reasonably good prediction without knowing the tech 
technical details because every technology has what we call a learning curve. The learning curve is less to do with time but more to do with installed capacity because then it really gets out into the market. And so as the installed capacity measured in cumulative megawatts or dollars spent or whatever goes down, it, there's improvement. And this is a logarithmic curve, which means it's actually improving exponentially every year. But the slope is very gentle. It's not like the Moore's Law learning curve, which is doubling the capacity every 18 months. This is not doing so well after uh, several decades. Uh, we've gone down by certainly less than a factor of uh, 10, probably a factor of five or six. There's only one way you can get off this learning curve with the current incremental improvements in technology. You get off because you just you can't do any better. Uh, or you get off of it because you invented something radically new, new slope, new learning curve. You can also get off of it if you over-subsidize. And that's what's happened with photovoltaic solar and wind. The subsidies in the world are so high that it's created an unusually high demand which means that there's a shortage of supply and the manufacturers can boost the prices or there's a shortage of silicon and so on. They will, it will adjust back, but it's fundamentally, you can't, there's only a certain speed where you can nudge this thing along. If you say, oh, I can, I can get to where I want to get go, I can get to 30% renewable energy by making more subsidies, up to, at some level, yes, up to a point that it backfires. And, it, and this is, well documented in anything you want to subsidize. And so you have to be a little bit careful. What we want to do is get on a new slope, a new learning curve. We're very, we're expert in nanotechnology materials. So we're not, we don't think we can add much to silicon. That's out in the industry. It's in good hands. But looking forward in the future, we have some really outstanding scientists. Uh, the Department of Energy has built a building that's a nanotechnology center and gives us $20 million a year to, to develop new methods in nanotechnology and teach researchers around the world, uh, which mostly includes researchers in universities, teach them these new methods. They take them back to their own campuses. They teach their students and so on. So it's a way of disseminating knowledge as well as creating new knowledge. And what we want to do is we want to use this nanotechnology to create very inexpensive solar cells solar cells that can be done on a continuous reel-to-reel -reel process the way you print newspaper. Uh, if we can get this to work at high efficiency, we're using very inexpensive materials that could scale to the volumes we'd like, then you could really transform the landscape. Uh, there's been a couple of companies that have been spun off in, in the inventions that have come out of Lawrence Berkeley Lab, but we are going back and trying to look at other inventions to just further along. You think you got something, venture capital will say, okay, we'll, we'll invest in it, but we will stay and try to generate more ideas and try to spin them off. Because we don't know which ones will work. Um, we're also looking at biofuels. And uh, BP has partnered with University of California, Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in Illinois. And they're giving us, um, not giving us, they're investing a half a billion dollars over 10 years. Much of this research will be openly published stuff. The lion's share will be openly published. Uh, anything discovered by University of California faculty members or Lawrence Berkeley Lab scientists will be owned until the intellectual property will be owned by us. Uh, BP still wants to do this. Um, the Department of Energy is also wants to do this. Um, and so they've invested in us at the tune of $25 million a year for a joint bioenergy institute along roughly the same lines. And we were privileged to be one of the institutes that were chosen for this as well. So what is it that we want to do? Well, I I'll, have I'll always believed, continue to believe that uh, raising corn for biofuels is just fundamentally not a good idea. It's not, it uses a lot of water, it uses a lot of valuable land. It's a huge energy input in terms of fertilizer. You have to till the soil every year. And so it's a barely break-even proposition in terms of CO2. And it's a barely break-even proposition in terms of fossil fuel invested to grow the corn and process it and the fuel you get out that replaces the oil. 
Um, what you would want to do is grow these things. This is a grass grown in a test field outside the University of Illinois. This is one of our collaborators, graduate student, in case you're wondering, she's five foot four inches. Um, in the fall time, the grass field was harvested and that was used to convert the cellulose material into biofuels. And the next year, this is what grew back. But the remarkable thing of what grew back, and it goes back year after year after year, is that there was no fertilizer used and no irrigation. So what these grasses do is, at the end of the growing season, many of the valuable nutrients, you know, there's not only cellulose material, but there's all sorts of mineral nutrients, there's all sorts of phosphates, there are all sorts of things, they actually bring them back into the soil. You've had this experience, or at least I've had the experience. When I was a young kid, I was paid by my father to weed the front lawn. And it was a, it was a piecemeal operation. We got a penny per weed. But we had to show the root. <laughs> because if you just ripped off the top, it would go back next year with a vengeance. So this is what happens to these plants. You rip off the top, it goes back next year with a vengeance. Good. You don't have to kill the soil. And many of the nutrients go back into the root. So it's plants like this that make much more sense. If done right, this has a chance of being ecologically sound, environmentally the world sound, if done right. There are even ways of doing this wrong. I don't see any way of growing biofuels from starches or soybeans and things like that to do it right. Um, what's the problem? Why aren't we doing this today? Well, it costs about two and a half times more money to, to take the cellulose material and break it into a fuel. We use very expensive enzymes that were discovered. You know, We grow microbes. We take the microbes. We extract the enzymes from the microbes. And over the 15-year period, uh, two companies have been trying to make the process more less expensive, and they found over this period of time that a cocktail of three enzymes work better than one enzyme to break this down, but they still need about a factor of three to go in cost. Now, <clears throat> here's another critter that eats cellulose. It's called a termite, and that's your home. But to a termite, it doesn't see you know, the granite tops or the wood trim or anything. It sees this good stuff, the cellulose. Now, if the termite eats cellulose, it can actually convert the cellulose into energy. Just as if we ate wood or weeds or things like that, we would just pass it through our system. We might full, feel full for about an hour, but you know, you're going to get it's not a good nutritious diet. So what the termite does, it enters in a little agreement. This is the stomach of a termite. Um, um, there's a several stomachs. Uh, you do this by taking the head of a termite in a tweezer and the tail of a termite and go like that, and then I'll cut the stomach. In the stomach, there are microbes. It's ghastly stuff. I've never seen this happen. I've had it described to me, and I'm glad I'm a physicist. Uh, <laughs> uh, inside the guts of the termite, there are communities of microbes, up to maybe 100 different ones, but many more than just one. And they, they munch on the food, and they take some of the energy, and they flourish down there. But they pass most of the energy back to the termite with the instructions, go get me more wood. So everybody is happy, or mostly everybody is happy. Uh, and so what we're doing is we are entering agreements with other companies, other researchers around the country. We're, we're scouring the world for hungrier and hungrier termites. Uh, that uh, where the microbes can break down the wood more easily and we're, under, and we're sequencing the genome, we're, under, we're in the process of understanding what is it that these microbes do that make it so effective. And then can we get a vat of these, you know, like a big termite stomach, but industrial size, uh, with even better microbes that we can. So that's one of the approaches that we are using. This is actually one of the research programs that BP is now investing. Um, in the end, though, uh, as the world population increases from its 6.5 billion people to somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people, and the good news is the population will probably peak at that point and actually go down. It's a wonderful thing that when I was a child, I thought there would be continued exponential growth in the number of people in the world. Bad news, doomsday disaster, and... Um, 
the Green Revolution prevented hundreds of millions to a billion people from starving in the 60s and 70s, but there's still this problem. The really great news is that when people get wealthier, they have fewer babies. It cuts across every culture. Uh, Catholic countries uh, are having fewer babies. Italy and Spain, for example, have negative population growth now. It, so it cuts across every religion, culture, everything. We don't really know why. You can make up reasons, or certainly some of them are not made up. It has to do with the education of women. It has to do with the fact that if your few children survive in old age, you're not worried about all your children dying. It has to do with the fact that there's late night television, so there's something else to do at night. <laughs> <laughs> the mixture, who knows? OK, but in terms of transportation fuel in this century, um, we Ethanol won't do it. Ethanol has too low an energy density. The biofuels we're actually going to be trying to make and will, will hopefully go beyond ethanol. We're, we're trying to make little microbes that replace yeast that convert simple sugars into ethanol to a microbe that, can, that is able to, in one fell swoop, convert the, the very complex polymer sugars into a fuel that self-separates from water. You know, oil doesn't mix with water. And you can harvest all the time. Right now, the yeast uh, slows down, and at 12, 14 percent alcohol, uh, the alcohol kills the yeast. So, so here again, we're trying to get beyond ethanol, but we're always going to be limited. Remember that map I showed you of where we can grow food and biofuels. And then, as the world gets richer, there's an increased competition of land use for animals, food for animals, which is a bit of a problem. There's also the increased population. There's also whether you, know, you have actually a contraction for biofuels. In the United States, we have so much agricultural capacity, this is not an issue. For the rest of the world, it's an issue. So I think at best, you have maybe 5% of the world's energy need from plant biofuels. Okay. It's the most expensive part, but it's still not going to really change um, a lot of things. So in the end, we need something better than plants or even algae. And so I'm reminded, or I'm reminding you of these. This is a sketchbook from Leonardo da Vinci. He's looking at birds. He would invent this contraption. You're supposed to put this on, use your arm and leg muscles, jump off a cliff, and you know, thrash around and hope for the best. Uh, now, the first successful power slide didn't use muscles. It wasn't an imitation of a bird. It was a hybrid solution. The wings of the Wright brothers' planes would warp. And they would control the flight by warping much the way a bird would warp its wings. You notice there's no vertical tail. There's only a horizontal one. Well, birds didn't have vertical tails. They only have horizontal ones. But the power mechanism was a gasoline engine. It didn't look anything like a bird. Now, you look at today's airplanes. There's a huge horizontal tail. There are huge jet engines made from single crystal metal technologies don't look anything like a bird, but they work actually better than birds for our purposes. Okay. Now, these 747s, to be sure, don't make, make little eggs that grow into big 747s. Probably that big horizontal tail will prevent that from happening. <laughs> well, again, that's speculation. But, uh, but they actually work better because we are allowed to use materials that were very high temperature materials like titanium, steel, and things like that. Okay? So in the end, what do we need to do? We have to invent a system using materials that are not accessible to nature. And they will take sunlight in, which is what a plant does. And the first thing it does is it takes a water molecule and it divides it into its molecular components of oxygen and hydrogen. So schematically, if you look at a plant, membrane, which the photosynthesis is really done, it's actually taking water and splitting into its constituent parts. It's also taking, so this is, this is more of a cartoon of the same, it also takes carbon dioxide and reduces it into um, carbon monoxide. Now, once you've got carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and oxygen, you begin to assemble molecules like methane. And so what a plant does is it takes these constituent parts and begins to make a hydrocarbon. 
and it's the stuff of the plant, the structural members, the cellulose and lignin. It's, you know, to a certain extent, it's the amount of little amount of starch that's used as a food supply for a new plant, as in a seed, uh, things of that nature, or in sugars in a sugar plant. Now, why do we want to do this? We want to do this because in the long run, we think we can make, like 747, we can make something far better than a plant. Not only that, the very precious water, which there will be huge shortages of because of climate change, uh, can be used, a large fraction of the water molecules can be actually be converted into uh, a transportation fuel, whereas most of the water the plant uses just passes through the leaves or goes into the ground. So this artificial photosynthesis is something that we started on, and the goal is in, in 10 years, we'll, we'll see where we are, but we hope to begin to get some companies in five or 10 years interested in, in going commercial. In order to do these very, very ambitious things, whether it's building efficiency systems or artificial photosynthesis or a new generation of photocells, what we need to do is assemble and collect some of the most brilliant scientists to work on it together. Uh, this is actually in the DNA of our laboratory. This is Ernest Lawrence, the founder of the laboratory. And he assembled around him some brilliant people. The Alvarez, McMillan, Cerber, uh, Oppenheimer, you've heard of. The, the top row all went on to get Nobel Prizes. Glenn Seaborg's not in this picture. He was one of another person in his team. And this team of scientists did things that individual scientists could not do. This, if you, in case you don't know, is the first transistor which was invented at Bell Laboratories. Bell Laboratories invested in teams of scientists who purposely make this transistor as a replacement for a vacuum tube. These three people got the Nobel Prize for the invention of the transistor, but what was going on at Bell Laboratories is whole bunches of other teams were working on how do you purify the silicon or germanium to a high enough level that it can be commercialized, it became viable. There was fundamental understanding of how electrons moved around in these semiconductors, what was actually happening in their junction that had to be understood. And so for the first nine years from the invention discovery that you can get diode action to the announcement of the transition in the following 10 years, the laboratories actually formed a basis, the scientific basis for the semiconductor industry of the world with lots of teams of scientists. Could not have been done this quickly in universities by a factor of two or three. If you have individual people working, coming to conferences, going back and working. So we are trying to do something like this and in these laboratories, whether it's Los Alamos uh, or the Lincoln Laboratories, which invented the radar needed in wartime, or in Bell Laboratories, which did so many of the inventions used industrially, you nurture individual genius. Uh, but once they, these, especially the young people who have the bright ideas, actually invent something, they can actually form a team. They can actually be made leaders of the team. In the 2006 Nobel Prize, George Smoot shared it with John Mather. George Smoot came to work as a postdoc at Bell Labs, uh, not Bell Labs, at Berkeley Labs. And uh, George and John Mather was a graduate student and went to work at Goddard. And those two shared the Nobel Prize for independent work that they've done. In the case of uh, George Smoot, he was put in charge of the team that got the Nobel Prize in his early 30s, about 31, 32 years old. And so it's very important that uh, management can recognize the really good people. There's a similar thing of another person who's going to get a Nobel Prize in a couple of years. Again, put in charge of a team, which included members of the National Academy of Sciences in his early 30s. In a university, that isn't done. There's an older professor who, who makes sure that he's in charge. Or she, uh, no, he's in charge. <laughs> and, and so if you have uh, in management, um, really man managed by top scientists, you can do this. And uh, you can also uh, expect some failures to take really bold things. So let me, let me stop by, finish by quoting two of my famous favorite authors. One is William Faulkner, and this is um, a brief two or three minute speech he gave at the Nobel Banquet in Stockholm. And he said in part of this, I believe that man, well, not merely endure, he will prevail. He is immortal not because he alone among creatures has an inexhaustible voice, 
but because he has a soul, a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. And I think with these virtues, the world can and will prevail over this energy challenge. This was in a preface uh, that I and Jose Goldenberg wrote. He's responsible for the Brazilian ethanol industry. And so that's one of my favorite authors, me. Um, uh, this appears in this report, Lighting the Way Towards a Sustainable Energy Future, which was released this fall. And, um, and I just want to leave you with this one image that was taken on Apollo 8, the first uh, Apollo mission that went around the far side of the moon. When it came back from the side of the moon we don't see, uh, one of the astronauts took this very famous photograph. It shows a very desolate moon. And off in the distance, what we call Earthrise, that the Earth uh, looks very much more inviting. It's a nicer place to live. And I want to stress that there's nothing else in sight. So we have to take care of this planet. Thank you. Okay, so there are two questions about water sources. Do we have any numbers that are showing how much groundwater and surface water lost in Southern California and capital of California? Uh, I don't have them up the top of my head, but I'm not sure what's meant by this, how much loss there is. There's certainly there's lots of water loss uh, in transporting the water, things of that nature. It's deeper than that because there's also a lot of... Uh, Due to over-fertilization, uh, we have a water problem because of the fertilizer runoff, the nitrate runoff in California. Uh, we, the use of water in the United States in agriculture is not sustainable. Uh, we are having to go deeper in California and in the Midwest. You have to do deeper and deeper wells. It costs more and more energy to get the water out. We use about 20% of the electricity in California to pump water, either from wells or in the aqueduct system. As water becomes scarcer, as our watershed areas become threatened, we will have to pump, move water over great distances, and so the energy budget for moving the water will go even higher, which means more carbon dioxide. Again, a runaway effect. Uh, so there are plans in California to increase the height of the existing hydroelectric uh, dams. There are plans all over the West to be shipping water great distances. Uh, very, that's a short-term Band-Aid. But in the long run, we've also got to do something about the watershed issue, the threatened trees, and the use of energy. And the next part is because groundwater can be stored more effectively in the surface. Oh, okay. Um, yes, uh, but then you've got to spend a great amount of energy to pump it up. Um, you know, the old windmills uh, were actually used to pump water <laughs> up. Uh, and so, uh, anyway. Um, the, it's a mixture of the groundwater storage and, and the water in the dams. The, you know, the mountains collect a lot of water. We don't collect, you know, it's a good storage mechanism. You want to use everything we've got because we need everything we've got and, that, and a little bit more. Uh, what, what about um, exotic forms of storage like flywheels? And what about um, visionary pie-in-the-sky solutions like cold fusion? Okay, flywheels, um, if you take a big, huge mass and spin it up, uh, you can actually store energy and just the kinetic energy of the spinning. It turns out that flywheels are actually one of the most, in order to keep this huge mass spinning safely, you've got to make, and that turns out to be actually more expensive than even current day batteries, which are very expensive. Um, and so while one can look at that, I think that's what I would call mature technology. As a scientist, you know, you can, you can, in mass production, you can expect some learning curves, certain things like that, but unless there's a fundamental breakthrough uh, in bearings, which, you know, the magnetically levitated bearings, for example, and things like that, it's going to have some limitations. Um, so I actually put more faith in, in, um, in batteries. Not the lithium-ion kind. They're, for a long time, they're not going to be uh, cost-effective. And only, they only make sense because you bought the battery for something else, like running your car. 
that it has the secondary use. It's like a, in a box top of a, you know, a warehouse. Uh, you've got a roof there. You put the roof there for to keep the rain off, but by golly, you can put solar cells there. And so the land was already paid for. The roof was already there. So, so uh, but I think there are some other technologies of batteries which I don't know um, are making great strides, but we'll see. Uh, there's a chemical energy is a good thing. I mean, the, the whole discussion of hydrogen is a way of storing energy. It's only a storage mechanism because you've got to get the hydrogen from somewhere. Right now, we get the hydrogen from taking coal or natural gas and converting it to hydrogen. You actually throw away a lot of the energy content when you do that. Unless you sequester the CO2, you're no better off. You're worse off because you're throwing away energy. But if you could, for example, uh, have a, a system of taking solar energy or wind and making it into hydrogen, and then you have an energy storage mechanism, then it starts to make sense. It also makes sense in a nuclear reactor because you don't want to turn on and off. All the cost of a nuclear reactor is in the capital cost. The fuel is 2% of the cost of running the thing. There's security costs, there are regulatory costs, there are all these other costs. Uh, but once you build it, you just want it to generate electrons as much as you can. In the win at night, you can be making hydrogen. So, uh, but the efficiency of the process is it's throwing away about two-thirds the energy to make the hydrogen, take the hydrogen, convert it back into uh, electricity. Two-thirds or three-quarters is it. It's very bad. So, again, one of the things we'd like to work on is to make a better way of making hydrogen or a hydrocarbon. Hydrogen is a start. I'm F. R. Benning from California, Energy Commission. Great honor to uh, listen to you, Dr. Chu here, uh, and to be in good company here. My question uh, actually is regarding one of your slides about uh, AC-DC transmission. Yes. Um, that is a very good point. I think there are some DC transmission lines on the east, uh, 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 on the uh, eastern side of our country, and you already mentioned about uh, China. But my uh, question or comment is a little simpler than that. Uh, for example, when we have photovoltaic system in our, on the roof of our homes, it produces DC electricity. Then we have a, a DC to AC converter in our homes. It converts to AC. And there are about like 15% losses there. Then from the plug of the wall, we create an AC into our uh, various uh, And then you devices, convert it back to DC. Laptop, right. computers, everything. And uh, then there is conversion to AC, uh, AC to right. DC again. Right. And then there are losses again. Right. So uh, why don't we look into some of these kind of simpler solutions? And also, not only that, your other slide that showed the uh, electric vehicle batteries using as a power storage or energy storage and then using it, that is also DC. Right. So if you would like to comment. I couldn't agree with you more. It's just how you make the transition. In fact, I've been actively trying to figure out how one can speak. It's a historical accident in large, it's not part, well, there was a competition when we were beginning to electrify the United States between Westinghouse and Edison. Edison wanted DC, Westinghouse wanted AC. The good thing about AC in those days is you can actually get it for very high voltages and and at very high voltages, you can transmit the energy much more efficiently. But all the devices, especially all Edison's patents, were not work better on DC. In fact, virtually everything we do works better with DC. The only, the one exception is now obsolete, and that is the syncing of the AC lines. Actually, the old time clocks were used. That's how they keep good, good time. The power companies are very, very particular about this because that they use the phase timing of how to transmit the electricity, okay? Everything else, you're essentially converting back to DC. Now, we have technologies that you can go to DC, you can use electronics to convert to very rapidly oscillating ultimate current, not 60 hertz, but really high frequencies, like 10,000, 20,000 hertz. Step it up to very high voltage, convert back to DC, 
go on these lines, and then step it back down. It turns out that's more efficient than staying with AC. Even the 60, slow 60 cycle has uh, radiation in it. Um, the more efficient fluorescent light bulbs work at 20 kilohertz. They don't work at 60 cycles. And going to very high frequencies means, you know, in the old fluorescent lamps day, there's this big thing called a ballast, and after a couple of years, it begins to hum and drive you crazy. Okay. Uh, you're, it's actually oscillating energy from the plasma of the fluorescent tube into this magnetic ballast and back again. Huge energy losses when you do that. And so by going to very high frequencies, you made it cheaper. You make it no longer humming uh, because little smaller capacitors and inductors can do it just fine. And we have little electronic switches that can do this now. That's what made the compact fluorescent light bulb viable. It's very high frequency. Okay? So, what's the problem? The problem is everything we work works on 60 hertz. So, what people are doing now is in large computer centers, servers, uh, they're beginning to think, and these things are using hundreds of megawatts 24 7. AOL server or Google server, each one of them. Okay? Small city, 24-7. Bring the power in, turn it to AC. DC, a AC to DC, the computer, you save 30% of your energy in all the little power supplies and all the fans and all this other stuff. So they're beginning to do this. And so I think the way, and I'm trying to advocate this, but the conserved power industry is saying, no, Steve, you can't do this, to get the bigger businesses to convert to DC internally. Because if it's a big enough enterprise, you can take the AC, convert, and everything runs on DC. So there's a market for the DC equipment. Commercial buildings, we can think of the same. So you're building the infrastructure of little pieces of equipment, the Xerox machines, the computers that run on DC. And more and more of that stuff, so as soon as it goes into a big enough institution, like a building or a factory or something, or a computer server, you convert to DC. All the parts are now DC. And the last thing would be the home. Right, because there's this inertial lag of that. Okay, so I, I'm trying to push this, but the power company guys say it's hopeless. <laughs> already been working on LED lights. Right. And LED lights again don't need AC; they need DC. Right. And uh, all that thing has happened very rapidly over the last uh, four or five years. And uh, it's only the 30% of our total energy being given in light. That's so right. So it makes sense to move towards uh, DC. Right. Uh, <coughs> Absolutely. And there's no argument. It's just how do you make the transition because of all the installed and the inertia of this. But I think, you know, by the end of this century, I hope we are DC. <laughs> I, it would take about a century, realistically. Hi. My name is Maria Kravchevich, and I'm also from the California Energy Commission. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you uh, about uh, the issue that you say that we have over-subsidized um, the technologies like solar photovoltaic, probably with some of our programs as well. Um, but now it just occurred to me that maybe part of the solution could be in the conversion to DC. Maybe that would be a way to, how should I say, incur some financial savings, and that could be somehow factored into the solution. What are your um, ideas instead of subsidizing these technologies? Which other way could we go? Well, let me say, I, I did say, and I do believe that there has been an oversubsidy, but actually you do need a subsidy of certain, otherwise you'll never, you'll never go down the learning curve. So, but this is an example. This is the cost of uh, power from combined cycle gas. And those bars are the cost of that. Wind has been going down, but the last couple of years it's been going up. And there's right now a shortage of the, uh, the supplier of wind turbines. The manufacturers are building as fast as they can, and then they'll sustain the price goes up. Um, I think subsidy at some level is really needed, but there has to be a clear sunset clause on that and a ratcheting down of the subsidy or something. Um, what I've seen in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, there were very large subsidies for a lot of technologies, including a less mature wind. And, um, 
And unfortunately, in the United States, those subsidies are seesawing back up and down like crazy. Uh, a lot of manufacturers got into the business because the subsidies were so good, but as soon as the subsidies were pulled, they got out of the business. They knowingly knew that the technology would not stand on its own. I think you need both some subsidy to let industry drive costs down, but you also, in certain things like silicon, we will not, in the next 10 years or five years, use silicon photocells to generate electricity by utility companies. It makes sense, within a factory three, it's going to make good sense to put them on the top of a, a warehouse. Again, because the roof is already there. But there's huge subsidies, and it, and it actually doesn't, if, if a homeowner is going to spend $30,000 or $20,000, they'd be better off putting in much more insulation, fixing the leaking windows and doors, um, getting better windows than making a solar job. So, uh, so it, it's good up to a point, but, but we fundamentally need, I think, um, if we're really going to go whole hog and take the full capability of the sun, we need a better idea. Well, um, that's already happening. You can either make, in, in solar thermal, you're actually concentrating the sun's energy. You heat up a very salty liquid that spins a turbine, or you actually have a thing that tracks and you've got a little Rankin engine in there that, or Stirling engine that actually makes electricity in this little module. That's already happening. Solar thermal is within a factor of three or four of commercial viability without subsidy, but th factor three or four is hugely away from what would ever get the interest of a power company unless there was an in, um, a big subsidy or a requirement like a renewable portfolio thing. So again, we photovoltaics, there's much more room to play because um, because you can really see that that could revolutionize things. The other ones, you're making, you, they are making improvements, but it's still very far away. Photovoltaics even further away from commercial viability for power plants generally. Um, so I think some subsidy is important, but you also should look a little forward five or ten years into the future and say, is there something that you could possibly invent that would just transform it? I don't think there's enough being done on that. There's a, it's like that battery. Within, once you had the idea, boom, you can make a company. It could be two or three years to make sure it's viable. You know, it, it, the first ones will be in your computer uh, and then in your car. But if it works and, you, and uh, it looks more manufacturable than the standard lithium batteries that you could really see in five years being mass produced big time. Because it, it was a new idea. So I think we, sh we always have to pay attention to that new idea that will transform the landscape. I, and, and we're talking about investing 5% of the money into the new idea sector. And then, you know, the subsidies are actually dwarf what goes actually goes into the research that could generate a new idea. It's been hugely, you know, this is hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, really, nationwide, where it's a, uh, can't even get an additional half a billion for new idea research. So that's my, now that sounds very self-serving, <laughs> and it is, but, <laughs> but I still, if, even if I didn't have this job, I would believe very strongly that, that uh, the new ideas are the things that really transform the landscape. Okay, so I have another question. What do you think of carbon capture and storage? Are you doing any research in this area? I think it has a lot of promise. Berkeley Lab is doing a lot of research in this area. Um, so this is the idea that you take a, a carbon from, a, let's say, a coal plant and you pump it underground. Um, you can put it in a well-sealed used gas well. And if it's well-sealed, we know that that geologic strata can keep the gas there for, for geological times. Uh, the question is, is, is it well sealed? Because in its extracting the gas, we now crack the rock on purpose. Um, another possibility is to put it deep underground in what are called saltwater water tables, aquifers, 
the idea there is that you, the carbon dioxide, you put in very high pressure, 5,000 pounds per square inch. It displaces the salt water, but it slowly re-dissolves. Once it re-dissolves, the salt water with the carbon dioxide has a negative buoyancy. It's heavier than just the salt water alone, so it's not going to come to the surface. And then it kind of works its way in cracks and crevices and forms a little microscopic uh, uh, droplets of, of carbon dioxide saturated uh, wa salt water. And once it's in that form, it's there forever. Uh, it's for the same reason that oil actually makes little droplets around the rock and there's a certain, in oil recovery, we can only get out roughly 30% of the oil in the ground. The less, rest we have to leave there. Because we don't know how to break the little surface tension of the oil droplets out of the, of the rock to, to extract it. So it's the, uh, and you know, you, in oil recovery, after you punch a hole in the ground and took out the oil from natural pressure, then you put in water and squeegee it out. And after that, you put in carbon dioxide and try to squeegee it out. But after all those things, Throwing all the kitchen sink technology we know today, you, you still leave 70% in the ground. So the same stuff will also work for carbon sequestration. So what are the what are the downsides? The downsides are that if it does leak out quite suddenly, that would be dangerous. Um, the geophysicists who work on this say we can work out safeguards that make sure that doesn't happen, but there's going to be a lot of resistance politically against putting it nearby in populated areas because there might be a very small chance that carbon dioxide would leak up. Let me remind you, 10% carbon dioxide will kill you. <laughs> and 1% starts to make you sleepy. So, so that's a problem. Uh, in the long run, we've got to figure out some way of taking a lot of the carbon that we're making from coal plants because the world will not turn its back on coal, unfortunately. The United States might delay it. And a lot of the permits for coal plants that have been applied for in the last bunch of years, about half of them have now been uh, uh, canceled, the applications. Uh, what happened in Texas and it's happening because of the uncertainty about carbon pricing, because of, uh, in large part, because of the cost of the coal plants is doomed through the roof because of the concrete and steel all sorts of issues, but China is not going to turn its back on coal. We eventually will not turn back on coal in India. Those are the three countries of the world that have the most coal reserves. And there's just too much of it. So carbon sequestration, I think, has to be part of the mix. Okay. We have experimental programs going on now, but there are just a few million tons a year, and we need to put away several billion tons a year before it becomes even a 10% effect on the world carbon dioxide. So we're a long way from it. It's not off the shelf ready to go. And, um, and unfortunately, there will be resistance, just as there's resistance, legal resistance to windmills. Um, are there any breakthroughs in the efficiency of the solar cells that uh, are being used by using different materials compared to silicon or something like that? Yeah. Um, I Well, there's a couple of breakthroughs. We're talking about commercial viability. So we, you know, our lab and others around the world have invented new nanotechnology solar cells. Uh, very, you can see it could be very inexpensive to make. Uh, on a commercial level, but their efficiency is not good yet. It's only 5%. We know what the problem is. It's the connection of the nanoparticle to the electrode. And so we're concentrating now on how to get those connections better. So they self-assemble like that polymer self battery self-assembles, and you automatically make good electrical connections by altering the, mic the molecular chemistry of these nanoparticles. There are other materials. Cadmium telluride has a shot. Okay, there are things called SIGs, copper, indium, sulfide, gallium materials. There are all sorts of things that people are looking at. They're, they're in the uh, startup company phase. Other people are looking at the research phase. Um, but still, silicon is still the best, despite all of that. Um, so. 
this is one of those things where we may not get a breakthrough in five or ten years. And the ideas we're pursuing, I'd say, maybe there's a 5% chance this idea will work. Work as in work, not to publish a paper. That doesn't count. Work as in it really becomes picked up and uh, brought to scale by industry. That's what, we, that's what working means. But if you have five or six really different ideas, each of them a 5% chance of working, well, it's now going to be a 50% chance or, you know, Oh, so I should stand somewhere else. Anyway, so if so, the idea is that you've got a lot of smart people trying different ideas. Each of them, you know, it's like venture capitalists. They, they, most of them go bust. There's only one in 20 that really make a big hit. But you know, those guys, if they make their bets right, actually are still very rich. So I think the United States and the world should be doing a bit of that. You know. So long-term research doesn't mean you won't see anything in 20 years. It means every year there's maybe a 5 or 10% chance that you'll get something really transformative. Okay. And it, again, it's a pittance investment compared to uh, uh, helping industry drive down manufacturing costs. Uh, hello. Uh, in my eyes, Iceland is a world champion in using geothermal energy. What's the problem with the United States then? Uh, well, we, Iceland is very blessed because it's got lots of water and it has a huge temperature gradient, in meaning that there's a lot of hot, porous rock close to the surface. And so actually Iceland is, is uh, planning to go to all uh, geothermal and uh, uh, hydro. Uh, for its complete electricity generation. But they're a special case. Uh, the problem is uh, what I described before. It's rare that you have a mixture of hot rock is okay, but you want it to, you know, a, a little impact that the heat is closer to the surface. It costs a lot of money to go six kilometers down. We can go much, much more than six kilometers down for oil wells, but then you're extracting, you know, lots of wealth. Um, I said before, you need rock that's porous. You need, um, so it has a porosity that, that allows you to put a heat transfer fluid in there. Uh, the the uh, natural geothermal sources that Iceland uses in Carlsbad, California, some other places have natural water supplies uh, and, and, uh, and the right porosity. So if you then say, can I crack the rock? Or can I supply the water, uh, and and the water doesn't plug up all the little holes that you've just put there? Uh, then it becomes a, a universal source. But we don't know how to do that yet. So so, and then there are certain really good sources like Yellowstone that people probably don't want us to. <laughs> That's a really good source, by the way. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, Iceland's, you know, got a gazillion Yellowstone to go around. <laughs> can you further explain the effort to conduct artificial photosynthesis in the helio effort to transfer solar energy to fuel? Are these, uh, are these uh, efforts working for the same result? Um, okay. Yes and no. I mean, we have the short-term research goal that's being... Um, sponsored by the Department of Energy and also by BP is to, it's more conventional technology. You grow plants uh, like those grasses I showed you and you try to develop better ways of breaking down the plant material into a biofuel. Um, and that's something where one is reasonably confident in five or ten years you're going to get a better way of breaking down cellulose which means you can use a lot of the agricultural waste or the timber waste that we generate as well. So that's the good thing and, and we're pretty confident that we can develop something that's better than what's been developed over the last 10 or 15 years. Now that may sound very arrogant but it, it's not as arrogant as it sounds. It's because with the resources that BP and the Department of Energy are giving us we can take a much broader view. We don't have to downflex to pick a potential winner early on. And so just like in, 
when the country wanted to make an atomic bomb, they, they looked at every possible thing. They had enough money, and they just did it. They attacked in a very different way than what a startup company can do or an individual researcher at university can do. So we can actually scour the earth for different termites. We have a rapid sequencing center. We have a lot of genomic odds. We have so much horsepower that we can do things that individual teams could not do. And you know, and uh, the good news is a lot of really smart people are going into this, young people. And also older uh, mid-age scientists are now beginning to think this is, is such an important problem. Such an essentially international emergency is, is creeping upon us that scientists who have really looked at what the, the downside risk of climate change are beginning to be more and more alarmed. Uh, I wish it could somehow be transferred over to our policymakers. But uh, there's a number of scientists who are getting really worried about this. Again, it only has to be a 78% chance that some of this might happen. But even if half of some of this might happen, it would be a, a world disaster. Artificial photosynthesis is very different. It starts from a very different tack. You can look at nature and look at molecularly how nature splits water, and we're we actually doing this. We are actually understanding the mechanisms, and you look at the actual molecules that do this, and it's really quite fascinating. When we look at the molecules that actually take the water apart and, and put it oxygen on one side and hydrogen on the other side, and we look at the core of that molecule, and we find the exact molecular structure, and we, we can duplicate that. We can put it on something else, like a carbon substrate. The thing doesn't work. It works at a thousand times less efficient. So all that other stuff of the molecule that we thought was kind of window dressing was an essential part that gave that molecule just the right amount of flexibility, physical flexibility to allow you to, to, to take the oxygen off of water. So what we're finding out is nature is really pretty smart. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> uh, and so we have a ways to go, but, but there, are, there are four or five different ways of doing this that, you know, we are splitting water, by the way, with artificial mechanisms. It's not efficient. We're trying to look at materials that can be brought to scale. So we use things like iron, not platinum. Platinum is used to, in electrolysis to split water, reasonably efficient, but you can't use platinum at this scale. The world doesn't have enough platinum or rhodium to, you know, to, to split water the way you learned in grade school. You know, electricity makes bubbles, hydrogen, oxygen. Uh, it's just not economically viable. Now, this, I think we're doing this as well, but I know it's being done elsewhere. It turns out that you can use a little microbe, a little, a little microbe uh, hydrogenase that actually is a stick it on a carbon electrode, which is really cheap. That little critter can split water. It can split it with the same efficiency as platinum. Okay, and it doesn't get poisoned like platinum. If platinum is exposed to sulfur, it's ruined. And so, so maybe a viable solution is to make a hybrid, and you've got these little microbes on a carbon electrode that does the, makes the hydrogen. Again, you know, it's kind of neat. It's happening. Can it be brought to scale? Can we understand what the microbe's really doing to make a better microbe? To make, of course, even better, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's a quasi-artificial photosynthesis. You made a hybrid between a little bug and an electrode. Uh, in the end, we probably want just a, you know, like a 747, just something that kind of works day in, day out, using these really artificial materials that last forever. Um, that's the other thing about plants. The molecules that actually do the water splitting can make the hydro, uh, hydrocarbon, they're called photosynthetic reaction centers. In bright sunlight, that molecular system gets blown up in less than an hour. So what the plant has, it senses what is happening. It has mechanisms to throttle back the, the energy so it doesn't, you know, to make it last an hour. But actually, there's something that stirs in and thinks, ah, I'm blown up. You take it out, you put it in another molecule, it's good to go again. Really good plant, right? That happens automatically in nature. We are very far away from making molecular-level self-repair like that. Mm, it's not working. Something stirs in, picks it up, pops in another one. 
so, but we are better at using more durable materials. Still can last for 25 years. Okay. So, you know, but yeah, I could, there's lots of ideas we're looking at and pursuing. Dr. Chu, thanks very much for coming. I very much enjoyed uh, your talk. Uh, you covered a lot of territory uh, re regarding investments and where we're, we're doing good things and where we're not. Um, I'm curious to hear your top three uh, where we're not investing enough, either the private sector or the, or the public sector, on the research side, and then your top three where the research has really been done and we should be putting more investment into commercializing those three areas and uh, three aspects of the energy field. Okay. Uh, the top things are in sectors of the economy where energy is still too small a sector to drive choices, um, like insulating your home, you know, $1,000 in labor and materials when you build a new home, uh, pay for itself in a year, year and a half. You just do it by regulation because the price of energy will never drive that choice. The granite top kitchen counter will drive a choice much more than that. Um, just like uh, mandating uh, higher efficiency fluorescent light bulbs, the high frequency ones. Uh, you know, within a, a hope of a couple of years, all commercial buildings should not have any in incandescent because we can make the substitute for the, the accent lights. We can do all these other things, and so. And lighting is a major fraction of the energy in a building. It generates heat, so you have to build a bigger air conditioning system to get out the heat, all this stuff. You do that by regulation uh, because the price of energy, even if it doubles, will not drive a choice, an informed choice. Uh, other things, um, you have to give an incentive, and uh, the incentive is called putting a price on carbon. Um, um, so that utility companies uh, can make uh, better choices because the real cost of putting all this carbon into the atmosphere is not captured in the cost of, of the energy. The real cost, it's just like the real cost of water pollution is not ever captured. It's always cheaper to dump a pollutant into a river than it is to treat it. If, if that you're only concerned about yourself, unless there's someone upstream from you doing the same. <laughs> And then it becomes far more expensive to deal with the polluted water and the economic and health you know, downsides of that. So there again, a regulation will have to prevent you from doing that, but you can also stimulate the marketplace and saying that the real cost of spewing all this carbon in the atmosphere that will give us the water shortages, uh, give, us, give us the social upheaval if, if the sea level rises and uh, all the airports in the Bay Area go underwater. Uh, doesn't take much. Or the Sacramento Delta, those levees, you know, a couple meters rise, they're at risk. They're actually about 140 are at risk today, just so you want to know. <laughs> uh, and there would be great catastrophes there. Okay, so, so we putting a price on carbon will actually fold in some of those what's Sometimes called externalities or external costs. That has to be there, and it has to be a very slow, steady increase. Just a pure market thing is a little bit scary because what industry wants is stability, uh, both on the high side and the low side. Um, industry mostly wants price to be so low that they won't change anything, and they're lobbying very strongly for that. But I think over a 10 or 15 year period, you can say, by giving, you know, by auctioning off the crest and controlling in that way, you can you can make it go up to where it would start changing, start to affect decisions, and that quite frankly is going to be about thirty, with today's technology, about thirty forty dollars a ton. Uh, at ten dollars a ton, no one's going to do anything there differently. Uh, so that that's that's something we have to do. So it's. A regulation, it's a price on carbon. Uh, regulation, we just don't squander things. And then, again, it's a, we have to think more deeply about the subsidy for installing today's technology, which is helpful. And I, I believe strong, most strongly in those subsidies actually go to the energy efficiency side. 
um, because that's more readily, you know, workable, commercially viable technology. There has to be ways of moving money around. Um, the progressive architects tell me that if you spent a little bit more in the building, 10, 20 percent more, you can start to get those investments paying for themselves in less than five or six years. Yet, that's not happening now because the builder may not be the owner. Or even if the builder is the owner, uh, the pot of money that's used to build the building is not the same as the pot of money that's used to run the building. And so even where there should be enlightened decisions, government buildings that are being built by the government, run by the government, or university buildings, which will be built by the university, run by the university, those decisions only in the last year are beginning to filter into the system. Progressive university presidents are now saying, we will spend the extra money or we will demand that the building be more efficient so it will pay for itself in five years. The building's going to be there for 50 years, 100 years. Makes good economic sense. But believe it or not, those decisions were not being made even by universities until very recent last year, okay? So it's part of it is getting the word out. Okay, now the last thing is this research. We do not have all the solutions, on the, especially on the supply side, and even on the demand side. For example, if we can get this system to work where you develop a, a software communication platform that's an open source platform that everybody can co-develop, like Mozilla or Linux, that uh, then you plug into that it's made more and more idiot-proof, right? But it's constantly being tweaked. Um, that would go a long way to giving builders the confidence you can actually, you know, because the first thing is they'd be very scared of a very high-tech building that uh, doesn't work or that you have to boot up every other day. You know, it's got to be better than Windows. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, now, you know, you, we have that system. We know how to do this. We have it in your automobiles and in your jet planes. Uh, they, they, they have mechanism. You know, if the computers in your flying the planes fail, that's catastrophic. So we naturally know how to do this. And, and believe me, as you well know, the pilots and the flight attendants in those planes don't know how to fix those systems. <laughs> okay? So we actually have the technology to do this. Uh, we have the know-how, but it, it, there has to be an initial investment, and then, and then it's a, and then you keep on making it better and better. So the more idiot-proof it is, the more foolproof it is, the more accepted it will be. Okay. So there's, and then finally, you know, there's new sources, crazy new sources of energy. We have to invest a little bit, at least, you know, um, the energy business in the United States is rough estimate, $2 trillion a year industry, not double counting. How much we spend on energy. And not respend, because, you know, like respend is, is takes energy to make a product, you pay more for power. I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about primary energy use, $2 trillion. Energy in the future, if we're going to save the planet, will be a high-tech thing. It can't be business as usual as industrial revolution, the first industrial revolution. Well, in a high-tech industry, we invest 10% in R&D. Well, that's $200 billion. How much is the United States investing in real research? I don't know, a billion? In a fourth decimal place, fifth decimal place? That's crazy. Okay, a billion dollars is one penny a cent tax on gasoline. Would you pay one more cent per gallon to become independent of a lot of people who don't really like us. <laughs> okay. So that's a you know I think I urge you to to really press on on your representatives both at the state level. The state's pretty good compared to the federal level by a long shot. But it's mostly at the federal level to say I won't stand for this. This is crazy. You know yes we have to make tough decisions. You notice the energy climate change thing hasn't even surfaced in the presidential debate. There's, there's, and yet, you know, 50 years from now, if half of this stuff is true, you've done something terrible to your grandkids and kids. Really terrible. 
you won't be here, so maybe that's okay. We won't be here. It's okay. You might be here. <laughs> I won't be here 50 years from now. And so this is, uh, and those unborn children can't march on Washington. And so you guys have to do something about it. Running out of time. Thank you, Dr. Chu.